Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about remembering and forgetting in the context of motor learning. Um, so a few terms that we use in this area of science are encoding, storage, rehearsal, and retrieval. Uh, so encoding refers to how information is transformed so that it can be remembered and stored in memory. Uh, storage is the process of placing that information in long-term memory. Rehearsal is the process that enables, enables a person to transfer information from working memory or short-term temporary memory into long-term memory. And retrieval is the process of going through our long-term memory and being able to retrieve or bring back information that was stored there. Um, so explicit memory tests. These are tests that ask someone to consciously call something to mind. So explicit, like you can explain it. You can um, outright discuss or recognize something um, as opposed to implicit, which is more implied or more subtle, or you can't necessarily uh, verbalize it clearly. Um, so an explicit memory test really asks what the person can consciously remember. Um, so there are two primary forms of explicit memory tests. Those are recall tests and recognition tests. A recall test requires a person to produce the response uh, with few, if any, available cues or aids. So on a test, that could be like a fill in the blank question or short answer type of question where you're not given options, you're not given any clues, you're simply asked a question and expected to produce the required response. A recognition test would be more like a multiple choice question or true false or like a matching question um, where you are given options and you're expected to be able to recognize the correct response out of many possible options. Uh, implicit memory tests are important for procedural knowledge. So where we can't necessarily verbalize that knowledge or um, where we can't necessarily explicitly answer a question, um, but where we should be able to demonstrate a task, for example. So we would use implicit memory tests in that case. So it could be like um, demonstrate how to do a tennis serve or demonstrate this dance routine. So things that are implicit, that are more based on your procedural memory as opposed to semantic. Okay, so causes of forgetting. There are a few specific reasons that we tend to forget, especially in um, movement. Um, now, forgetting is generally considered to be a retrieval problem, not missing information. Um, so the, the general agreed upon consensus here is that once we store information, it's there probably forever. But the problem when we forget is not about that information being there, it's about our ability to find and retrieve that information. Um, I often, when students are, are talking about being able to remember vast amounts of information, like I, I teach a lot of anatomy and physiology, which requires a large amount of memorization and ability to retrieve those, those, those names and terms and information later. Um, and one thing I see with students is consuming information like you read and read and read and read and read and watch lectures and listen and and you're consuming information but memory is not only the consumption of all of that you have to practice retrieving it and that's where strategies like flashcards come in um is that you've consumed the information it's in there and now you need to practice being able to pull it up when you need it and being able to find the right information at the right time. Um, and so that's really where forgetting happens is when you can't retrieve what you need. Um, so there's a few different causes of forgetting. Um, one is called trace decay. Uh, that's when forgetting occurs with the passing of time. Um, this is really difficult to test scientifically. So we don't know much about why or how this happens. Um, but it's thought to be likely that we're misplacing uh, the information or the experience um, rather than actual decay or deterioration of the memory itself. So it's not likely that the actual information is deteriorating. It's more likely that it's kind of misplaced or it's not important. It happened a long time ago and it hasn't been important. So it's just kind of in a junk drawer somewhere, so to speak. 
Um, and so that's trace decay. Uh, proactive interference and retroactive interference uh, are related to what happens immediately before or after we receive the information that we're going to store. Um, so like, for example, proactive interference, an example is in gymnastics, if the um, competitors are warming up in front of the judges, let's say the judges are sitting um, at their station, they're sitting at their tables and the gymnasts are warming up in front of them. Um, a gymnastics judge can be influenced by what they see the competitors doing during warm up before the competition. So even if how they perform in the actual competition is entirely different from how they performed during their warm up, um, what the judges witnessed before the presentation of the information that really mattered, which is the competition, uh, what they saw immediately beforehand can influence um, how they receive and store that information. And that's an example of proactive interference. Retroactive interference is the exact same phenomenon, but where uh, the information that's presented after the important information is what uh, interferes. So proactive means something happened before the important information. Retroactive means something happened after the important information. And it's somehow muddying the important thing that you're trying to actually store and pay attention to. Um, it's not, again, not super well understood, but it is a phenomenon that has been observed. And it seems to be that there's confusion when, uh, like, especially with movements, if the movement is very similar to what you are actually trying to pay attention to and trying to store in memory, if the interfering event is very similar, then it will, it's more likely to cause proactive or retroactive interference. Like in the gymnastic situation, if they're warming up and practicing the actual thing they're going to use in competition, then it's extremely similar, maybe even the same. And so the judges might confuse those performances in their judging. Okay, movement characteristics. Uh, so movement endpoint location is remembered better than the movement distance. So a good example of that is in a golf swing. So it's easier to remember the end point location of your limbs than it is to remember the distance you're traveling to get to that end point. Um, and so there's all sorts of research that's been done where you move the end point and keep the distance the same. And then people struggle to complete the movement correctly because we don't, we're not very good at estimating distances, but we are very good at being able to kind of land the end point, like if the end point remains the same. So we can keep the end point the same and change the distance and be successful. But if we keep the distance the same and move the end point, we have a much harder time doing that accurately. Um, and so to estimate distance, we tend to like count or use different types of mechanisms to try and estimate distance more accurately. Uh, limb positioning movements are easier to remember when it's within the person's own body space. Um, so when we give cues about where our body parts are in space, that helps us remember. So like if you're coaching someone and you give them cues about like lift your elbow or think about where your elbow is in relation to your shoulder. And we give those sorts of cues um, to help the person kind of remember where their limbs are positioned in space relative to other parts of their body or relative to their environment. It helps. Uh, it's also important to instruct them not to look at it. Um, like, let's say the cue is elbow up, like keep your elbow above your shoulder. Maybe that's the cue. If they turn and look at it, that will actually interfere with their memory and understanding of where their limb positions are. Um, instead, they should be cued to pay attention to where it is without looking, like feel what that feels like. And we're more likely to be able to do that again accurately later. Um, movements are also remembered better if we can relate them to something we already know. Um, so if the new movement is similar to a movement that we can already do, um, that is helpful. Um, or if the movement resembles a triangle instead of some abstract shape. So like if we can relate the movement and give it meaning, um, if we can relate it to something we already know how to do or a shape we're familiar with or something like that, that will help us remember how to do that movement correctly. Uh, so ways to enhance memory performance, as I just mentioned, meaning helps. 
So if we can find ways to increase the meaningfulness of the movement, um, so connect the movement to something that they already know, then that will help remember. Um, so I give the example of French fries and pizza. So if you know how to ski, you may have heard these terms before. Uh, French fries meaning like have your skis parallel to one another and then you go faster. And pizza, you angle in towards each other and it slows you down. So if you think about French fries, like two parallel lines and pizza, like you're you're making a triangle shape like a pizza. Um, so that's a way to increase the meaningfulness. You're giving a verbal label to those two movements um, that that create kind of imagery about the shape of those movements and how you should be positioning your skis. Um, and that that adds meaning to something that would otherwise just be pretty abstract and might be more difficult to remember. Um, a second strategy is the intention to remember. So planning to remember on purpose. So when we are just going through our lives, there's tons of stuff that we just aren't going to remember because we're not trying to. We're not taking in that information with the intention to remember it. But when we go into a situation with the intention to remember, we are far more likely to actually remember. So like when people say they're not good at remembering names, for example, well, if you're, if like, let's say you meet new people and you're shaking hands and introducing and, and hearing names, if you're not really hearing the names and trying to remember on purpose while you're storing the information, you're not going to be very likely to retrieve it later. But if you're hearing a name and shaking a hand and thinking, I'm going to remember this person's name later, you're a lot more likely to maybe mentally rehearse it a little bit and to store it and be able to retrieve it later because you're you're storing the information with the intention to remember it. Um, and we've all experienced, like, if you know you're learning something right now and you're going to be tested on it later, you go in with a different intention. You increase your effort and your attention to what you're learning because you know you're going to be tested later versus you don't know you're going to be tested later. And then there's a test and you don't know any of the information because you weren't learning and taking in that information with the intention to remember it. So intention makes a very big difference. And then finally, subjective organization. Uh, so grouping or organizing large amounts of information into units that are meaningful to the individual. Um, we also refer to this as chunking, clustering, or grouping. Um, so it's a way where we can learn in shorter, more manageable chunks. Um, so I, I described this a little bit in the previous video about like a phone number, for example. It's easier to remember a 10 digit phone number when we group that into um, area code and then the first three and then the last four. That's an example of chunks where it's going to be easier to remember 10 digits than if we just had one big long string of 10 digits without dividing that up at all. Okay, so practice test context effects. So what we mean here is the relationship between the context when we practice something and the context when we're tested on that same information. The relationship is important. Um, and that can mean environmental context and personal context. So like, let's say for example, I teach a class in a physical classroom and we are in that class every day, learning the information and practicing and, and going over it. And then for the day of the test, let's say we move to a totally different room, that is going to make a difference on how the students perform on that test. Because we just changed the physical environment from one place where we did all of our practice all semester long to a totally new environment with different sounds and smells and people and configuration of desks or whatever is different there. If we have an entirely different environmental context, then that is going to affect performance for the class overall. You know, some students will do better than others, um, but overall there will be a difference in test scores compared to if they took that test in the same room where we had our class all of those different times. Um, same goes for things like personal context. So like your mood, uh, what limbs you used, if it's a physical movement, um, whether you're sitting or standing, different sensory feedback sources, substances that you could have in your body. Um, like, let's say, for example, um, maybe maybe you're not much of a coffee drinker. 
But then the day of the test, you decide you're going to drink coffee because you've heard that caffeine can enhance your performance or make you think more clearly. Well, in that case, it's actually probably going to work against you because now your personal context has changed from what you were experiencing during practice to what you were experiencing during the testing conditions. So it's like, although that caffeine could help in general, it would only help if that was part of your practice conditions and then you continue it and that's part of your testing conditions. Or like and from a, per, um, a physical standpoint, um, like maybe there's a workout ergogenic aid sort of thing. Um, if you're not taking it in your normal practice conditions, don't take it on your competition day. So you want your testing condition, so your competition or you know, when you're taking a, an exam or something, you want all of those conditions to as closely match your practice conditions as possible. And that is going to enhance your performance. Um, any kind of changes or differences between your practice conditions and your testing conditions are likely to affect your performance. So more similarity will mean better performance. So the encoding specificity principle says that memory test performance is directly related to the amount of similarity between the practice and the test conditions. And again, that's physical competition and that's also like academic, like mental testing, uh, cognitive function. Um, so it applies to closed skill situations, especially like shooting a free throw. Um, so practice situations should closely resemble performance situations as much as possible. So like as a teacher or a coach or someone who's trying to help students or athletes or patients um, be able to step up to the challenge and be able to perform the best they can, uh, the best way to do that is try to get your practice conditions to as closely match the, the testing or competition conditions as you possibly can. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.